Okay. So Stephen Bolavia is our presenter. He is an adjunct professor of physics at the Suffolk County Community College and principal engineer for the Vera Rubin telescope camera at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Stephen is an amateur astronomer and, and telescope maker. He is an aerospace engineer who worked for Grumman Aerospace with the thermodynamics group of the space division. He had a key role in developing a nuclear rocket engine and performed the analysis, design, and fabrication of the microgravity liquid droplet radiator that flew on space shuttle mission STS-029. Steve has been in, at Brookhaven National Laboratory since 1992 and was the principal mechanical engineer for the camera on the Vera Rubin, formerly called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Prior to that, he was doing research and engineering for the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider and the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory. Steve has been recognized for the discovery of the Clair Obscure Effect, Lunar L, quote Lunar L, which is described in the December 2018 issue of Astronomy Magazine. Steve is an assistant adjunct professor of astronomy and physics, I mentioned at Suffolk County Community College, and the Astronomy Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Custer Institute and Observatory in South Hold, New York. We are looking forward to hearing about the invisible universe. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, these are the buttons. Yep. Okay, hi everybody. Can, first question is, can you hear me at home and can you hear me here? I hear you great. Okay, great. So thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. I haven't been here in years. We used to meet up at Tacanic Lake and I would come to the star parties and do stuff here. And it's just been so many years. It's, uh, it's great to be back. So thank you. So I have to start off by apologizing for three things. Uh, I'm sorry you have to listen to me on a night of the new moon during the Messier Marathon. Um, but this is how it works. It's the third Tuesday and I'm off from spring break. Otherwise, I couldn't be here because my classes are Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, the second thing I'm going to apologize for is the first 40% or so of this talk assumes you know nothing. And I know amateur astronomers know more than professional astronomers. So you're going to just have to bear with it. The teaching part of me says that I have to assume nobody knows anything when I start something. Uh, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. And, and the last thing I have to apologize for is that I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. I'm going to talk about more about the engineering of what gets us science and not the science itself, because that's the side of the uh, astronomy that I'm coming from. Okay, so the invisible universe. So it starts with a question. If I can get the slides to change. Uh oh. I'm not changing slides. It might be on a screen. That's right. Not the actual. Yeah. There we go. Okay, there you go. That's it. It says, okay, so it starts. Thank you. So it starts with the question, what is invisible in the universe? And you probably know all this, uh, lots of things, right? You know, magnetic fields, air, X-rays, ultraviolet light, gamma rays, radio waves, all kinds of stuff is, is invisible, but we don't have that kind of time. So we're gonna talk about two of them, which are gravitational waves and radio waves. Um, specifically, we're gonna talk about projects at Brookhaven Laboratory, the BMX and Puma experiments, and then Lucy. And we're gonna talk about LIGO for gravitational waves. So as I said, we're gonna be talking more about the instruments than the science. Uh, so what are radio waves? And I know you all know this, but it's light. It's, it's no different than visible light, except that you can't see it, right? So, um, so here's a sort of little, you know, you've probably seen this many times. It shows the little thin slice of electromagnetic radiation or light that our eyes can see. And we kind of always think of light as what we can see with our eyes. But as you know, it goes all the way from radio very long wavelengths to very short, high energetic wavelengths of gamma rays and everything in between. And there's little images that show relative size of the wavelengths from buildings down to atomic nuclei sizes. Um, the human eye is a visible light receiver and a radio is a lower energy electromagnetic wave receiver and they are not really equal, but they kind of are. So it's a, a weird comparison, but our eye is kind of like the radio except it works differently. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning this is it's as if you've gone to a, a concert and you can only hear like three, new, three notes of the flute and one of the oboe and you miss the entire concert. You've missed the whole thing. The universe is playing in all these wavelengths and it's only recently. And when I say recently, I mean like maybe the last 
60 or 70 years that we're finally tuning in to the different wavelengths that the universe is playing. So here's a little history of radio astronomy because I find this interesting actually is uh, that first radio waves are predicted, right? This is a theory at first in 1867. And then 20 years later, uh, Hertz demonstrates electromagnetic waves through experiments and that they move at the speed of light and that it is light. Uh, and then another 10 years, Marconi and, and uh, Braun get the Nobel prize for building a wireless, you know, radio, right? Which is basically a spark generator that you can receive. Uh, and then some years later, uh, Carl Jansky at Bell Labs is told, he's an electrical engineer, so I kind of like this story the best because I'm an engineer. Um, his boss tells him, go find out what's causing the static on these transatlantic phone calls that everybody's complaining about and discovers radio waves from the center of our galaxy, right? And this is a result of Bell Labs down in New Jersey. And then also in New Jersey, Penzias and Wilson discover the cosmic microwave background with their uh, horn antenna. And that's another Nobel Prize. By the way, almost all these people got Nobel Prizes. Uh, so, so here's a, a picture of what they call the merry-go-round antenna. This was called Jansky built this to try to figure out what was causing the static in these. And by the way, I don't know if you realize, back in these days, 1932, a transatlantic phone call was super expensive. And the people that were paying for it were super annoyed to be getting static. So, so, so his job was to go out and find it. And, and to make a long story short, he noticed that the hissing or the these statics were sort of on a period. And then he realized that the period was almost 24 hours, not quite. It was 23 hours, 56 minutes, which is how fast the stars rise and set. And him and the buddy that kind of figured that out got the Nobel Prize in physics for that. Um, and then there's also New Jersey, the horn antenna, which was uh, the beginning of the cosmic microwave background. When they first used it, they thought it was a steady, very uniform background. And it's only recently through um, other uh, probes up, up in satellites in space uh, that have shown that there's actually a structure to the cosmic microwave background. Um, so a radio telescope is a lot like a regular telescope. It kind of looks like a, a Cassegrain style scope. There's a, the light comes in, it hits a, a parabolic uh, surface like a mirror, and then it hits another surface, which is the subreflector, and then goes into a feed horn, which is kind of like your eyepiece or camera. And then you have to convert it to something that, you know, since it's not visible light, you have to convert it to something else. And that's where you have amplifiers and computers and display systems. But it's really a telescope. It's still photons being collected and focused to a point from a distant object. Um, the Arecibo used to be the biggest telescope in the world. It's 305 meters. It's huge. It's currently defunct, but there are groups trying to resurrect it, of which Brookhaven National Lab is one of the contributors. So it may come back, no promises. We may get Arecibo back and it's done great things. And I like it because it's in the beginning of the movie Contact with Jodie Foster and Matthew McGonaghy. If anyone remembers that old 1990s movie, which, which might've been part of the influence of why I went the way I went in my career. Uh, I thought it was a great movie, like Interstellar. Um, and now there's the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope, the FAST, you know, that's called FAST. That's why the name comes from. And that was just completed in China. So now this is the, the world's largest radio telescope. Uh, but those don't move. Those two telescopes are fixed. They wait for things to pass by. They're stationary telescopes. The largest steerable telescope, the one that can track stuff, uh, is also really big. Um, this one is, uh, I forget how many meters. I think it's, a, it's 100 meters. It says it somewhere. Um, but this is a very well-used telescope. This telescope has no downtime and it operates at a broad range of frequencies um, and it's fully steerable. Uh, it gets about 6,500 hours each year of which two to 3,000 hours are used for high frequency science. And this is down in Green Bank, West Virginia, which is also the home of the uh, National Radio Observatory for the United States. So this is the world's largest fully steerable, 100 meter, it says it, fully steerable telescope. Um, and then of course there's arrays. There's, there's telescopes that can be put into an array. And the nice thing about radio astronomy is the, uh, the wavelengths are big enough and the signals can be conditioned that you can make an array act like an aperture that's as big as the entire array without having to fill it with telescopes. You can have like a lot of empty space and still get that same resolution from aperture. Because as most astronomers know, amateur astronomers know aperture is everything, right? Aperture is king. Uh, and this is 27 radio telescopes in New Mexico, named after Carl Jansky, who kind of started this whole thing. Um, and then there's ALMA up way up high, like very high. You need oxygen, I think, when you go there. It's at 5,000 meters. Uh, oh, we got a, a thing came up. That was weird. I might be able to just minimize that. There we go. And I did. That was self-sufficient. Thank you. 
uh, and ALMA stands for the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, because that's the wavelengths it works in. And they, they change the uh, positions of the telescope depending whether they're doing millimeters or submillimeters. Uh, and those are 12 meter dishes uh, you know, up on top of this plateau in Chile. Um, and then there's the really, really, really big radio telescope. And it's only big because they're using radio telescopes all around the globe to form a very large baseline for interferometry uh, radio astronomy. And they use all kinds of crazy atomic clocks and GPS systems to get this synchronized to work because it's even though radio is easier than light to do aperture synthesis, uh, it's, it's you know, still tough to do. This is not an easy thing to do. And what did this telescope do? Well, you know, and by the way, this is like having a telescope half the size of the Earth. So that's pretty big. Well, it's the first image of, by humans of a uh, black hole in space. This is the black hole in the center of galaxy M87. Um, and there's, there's the black hole that you don't actually see, but you see the event horizon around it and you start seeing glowing gas dust plasma circulating around it. And this is what they imaged. But, but what's amazing is the, uh, the, the resolution. It's 42 micro arc seconds is the resolution of this radio telescope. And, People here that do imaging know, like, if you can get one arc second resolution here on Earth, you're doing pretty good with seeing and telescope aperture. But to get 42 micro arc seconds is just incredible. And this was a massive black hole. This is a billion times the mass of the sun, 10 to the ninth. So, and this is one of the reasons they picked this black hole is because it's big enough. Yes. Okay, so picture from radio telescope. They're taking radio waves and making it something you can see. My best analogy for that is if anybody's ever used a handheld FLIR, which is infrared to see like their house leaking heat out of the roof, you, you can't see that light either, but the FLIR converts the non-visible to visible. This is a similar thing. They're taking the radio data, which is photons and making in, invisible wavelengths on a computer monitor. So that's what it's doing. It's basically converting photons you can't see to photons you can, not, not much different than what a FLIR does with infrared. You're just gonna convert it to something you can see. Um, and the second picture of a black hole ever done was in our own Milky Way galaxy. And, and the reason they did the M87 first is this one is a thousand times smaller and blocked by our own galaxy. It's kind of like, you know, it's in the way of, it's behind the things that are in our way, like other, you know, stars and things, mostly stars and dust. So this was the second image of a black hole. And this was done very recently. This was May, 2022. So last year, not quite a year ago, we've gotten uh, the second image of a black hole from our own galaxy. Um, so, oh good, so the video plays. So what's interesting is since the uh, M87 black hole is a thousand times bigger in diameter, the light that's moving around it takes longer to get around. It's still moving at the speed of light, but its orbital period is much slower. Whereas the Milky Way galaxy being a thousand times smaller, the light, and by the way, it takes for the Milky Way galaxy, I think it takes a, a couple of days to orbit. And for the M87 at the speed of light, it takes like a hundred years for light to get around. Uh, so, so even at the speed of light, the thing is so big, it takes forever. So what you're looking at is basically that event horizon and the, the energized plasma gas dust orbiting. And by stacking images, um, they were able to create sort of animated time lapses of what they were seeing. And it's pretty neat that we can see what's happening around the black hole. You can't see the black hole itself, but you can see all the stuff that's happening around it. And once again, you can see in the video, I guess it's on the order of 100 days. It looks like about 170, 180 days goes by and then it loops again. Oh, actually a couple of hundred. And this is hours. Um, for, the, for, our gal for our galaxies, black hole, it's hours. So about 200 days for that one and a bunch of hours for us. And we still call the, our black hole Sagittarius A because whenever you discover a radio source, it becomes A is the first one, B is the second one you've discovered in Sagittarius and so on. So that's Sagittarius A is, was originally discovered as a radio source long before they knew it could have been, though there was suspicion it was a black hole. So what are radio sources in astronomy? Well, black holes, we just talked about that. The sun is a radio source. Jupiter and its moon Io is a radio source. It's sort of like in the FM or lower K band, I think that is. Um, supernova remnants, stars that have exploded and died. Pulsars star forming regions, what they call radio galaxies. And then we talked about the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. So this is what the sun looks like at 4.6 gigahertz. And what they've done is they've colorized the areas for different temperatures. In other words, different energy levels recorded by radio. So this is the resolution they're getting on the sun because it's pretty close. 
And we can see from 6,000 K to a million Kelvin on the surface of the sun using radio telescopes. So this is pretty neat that we can start mapping out temperature regions on the sun. And they're probably also at different depths too, they're not necessarily on the surface of the sun, but these are the signals we're getting. Um, Jupiter and Io do funny things. I mean, Io has got sulfur and stuff that spews out of volcanoes while it's orbiting a planet with an incredible magnetic field. And it starts becoming a radio transmitter. <laughs> it's sort of like this weird, you know, uh, magnetron that's uh, generating a signal. And on the right is sort of a, a plot of what the signal looks like. And it's also in the megahertz range, right? There's 15 to 35 megahertz. Um, so Jupiter and Io is a, ra a strong radio source that people build radio telescopes and look at with it. Cygnus A, this is a radio source of a um, radio galaxy. And it looks like a twin to me. And this is uh, at five gigahertz again, similar to the sun's uh, frequencies. And this is 600 million light years away. This is not like a regular galaxy, like looking at M51 or M81 or those galaxies. This is really far, but it's a strong radio source. And this is done from the Carl Jansky Array in New Mexico. Uh, and if you could see the sky with radio eyes, this is what it would look like, right? This is very different than what your eyes would see. Here's some of the things we're talking about, right? So this is a photograph done with a radio telescope, right? This is the uh, aperture synthesis. This is making an image out of light you can't see. And you can see a supernova remnant there. I don't know which one that is, uh, a, a, a star forming region. Um, I'm almost guessing this could be Orion and um, the Spaghetti Nebula because it looks like it's in the right spot. Uh, a, a 5 billion year quasar galaxy. Uh, and that, that messes me up a 5 billion year, something 5 billion years away because if we're looking at them now and they're there looking back, we don't exist yet. We haven't even formed. The sun hasn't even formed yet. So <laughs> that's weird. Uh, <laughs> that we're looking at something that if the reverse was happening, we, we're, not, we're not even here. Uh, so that's just a weird thought that bothers me. It should bother everybody. Uh, <laughs> and if it doesn't, <laughs> then you're a lot smarter than I am. Um, and then the cosmic microwave background, which now this is from the, uh, the W map, the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe done from 2003 to 2012. And I believe that satellite is done, uh, but it's a microwave image of, the, big, the remnants of the Big Bang, when the universe first formed, um, it was in a higher frequency, but kind of like Doppler shift, you know, like an ambulance goes by and you see the pitch drops. It goes, well, this is the pitch drop from 13.77 billion years ago. You're looking at what was a higher energy signal now stretched to very long wavelengths. And what's left is these radio signatures that show where possibly galaxy formations and things started from. The different, and the diff temperature differences are talking are, are, are millikelvin or even microkelvin temperature differences that show the difference in structure of the universe at that early stage. So we're looking at possible places where, you know, little filamentary galaxy formations started because of different concentrations of masses that eventually you know, uh, congealed together to form stars that formed galaxies and so on and galaxy clusters. So this is the latest cosmic microwave background, latest as of 2012, I haven't seen new data yet. And this is a broad range, 23 to 94 gigahertz. Um, so now that was just the introduction. That's why I was talking fast because you guys know all this stuff because you're amateur astronomers. I, I'm serious, by the way, I've, I work with astronomers like daily at Brookhaven Lab and, and the amateurs know more than them. I mean, maybe not down to the details they know, but the amateurs are like way on top of stuff. They're like, I didn't know that, you know. It's a, it's a, um, so BMX, this is built at Brookhaven National Laboratory. This is a prototype radio telescope that we've built. And um, me, myself, summer students were involved. Uh, and what does BMX stand for? It's the Baryon Mopping, Mapping Experiment. And it's a interferometric array. It's, uh, it's made as a prototype, a pathfinder. And we're looking at the reionization error, the 21 centimeter intensity mapping, which we're gonna talk about later. Uh, it's it's four, four meter reflectors. Uh, it's once again, a non-moving telescope. It doesn't track, it waits for things to pass. And has a horn feed. It's a orthomode transducer. If you know about radios, you know this stuff. I don't, I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm not electrical. Uh, but I, you know, I know the words. <laughs> pulse noise injection diode. And I like this picture. Uh, so I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the person on the far left, Paul O'Connor, uh, he and I worked together for 10 years on building the camera 
for the what was called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, now called the Vera Rubin Telescope. He was the principal scientist, the principal investigator. I was the principal mechanical engineer. The person in the middle, uh, Sven Herman, he was the principal electrical engineer. My job was mostly to take away the heat that Sven caused. Th th this is the reason why when they interview you for jobs, they're more concerned about how well you get along with people versus your skill level because Sven kept making me problems, <laughs> but we got along very well and we solved those problems together. And then on the, the far right is uh, Andrzej Slozar and he's the head of the cosmological department at Brookhaven National Lab. So he mostly does cosmology, which is sort of like a new term, new like as last maybe 10 or 20 years, even though it goes back to Zwicky, but it's a term that's used. Yes. No, it's in a divot. Well, yeah, that helps, but that's that's a, a, a abandoned um, overflow for water. <laughs> so, so it was nice and flat. The ground was really hard and it doesn't hurt the little shielding. So what's interesting is we don't necessarily want to shield it. One of the main purposes of this experiment, which I'll talk about a little bit, is to find how to get rid of noise. And what better place to build this than in Long Island, New York? I mean, we're, we're so loaded with noise that if we can solve the problem here, we can solve it anywhere. And that's I'm serious about that. It's a we're, we're, we're the main purpose of this experiment is how to really get into high signal to noise ratios in a noisy environment. Uh, so that's one of the reasons it was built there. Uh, so what are we looking for? A 21 centimeter hydrogen. So this is like a little physics chart. I'm not going to go too deep into it because I, I do teach physics at night, but I'm not a physicist. Uh, <laughs> um, hydrogen, as you know, goes through different energy levels. And people that do astrophotography know hydrogen alpha, right? That's one of the bomber series. Uh, when electrons change shells, you give off a photon. And it happens at all different places, at all different wavelengths. And the top one is the um, from thermal energy. Um, not very resolvable. It's uh, Doppler broadening. The middle one is fine structure, and that's getting a little better. Uh, and that's also like in the four, you know, to 10 to the minus six electron volt range. But the one we're looking at is the hyperfine structure, they call it. This is the 21 centimeter line. This was predicted to happen, that hydrogen would have a very noticeable uh, spectroscopic line. And that's what this is taking advantage of. And it's interesting because this was from like 1951, it was predicted in 1951, it was observed in 1944, it was predicted. And this is what we're banking on now. We're using this phenomena of hydrogen to look at stuff that will reveal things that we're gonna talk about. Uh, so yeah, this is what's interesting. So I took this picture, it's not great. I'm an amateur astrophotographer. Um, and if I were to ask you, do you think these galaxies are interacting would you be able to tell by looking at this picture? Are these galaxies interacting? And the three, I'm, the main three I'm talking about is M81, M82, NGC 3077. And this is a Herschel object and I don't remember the number that ended up in the picture. But some people will tell you, well, the starburst in M82 is because M81 is tugging on it. But I don't see that. I just see three galaxies by themselves. But what if we could look at this at 21 centimeters? What would it look like? Right? Now, they're interacting. Um, and so I made this little animated GIF that I really like. Um, right, this is the difference between visible light and 21 centimeter light. This is the tuba you couldn't hear when you went to that concert because your frequency was too narrow band. So this is the reason 21 centimeter is so exciting. I mean, this is, we're gonna start seeing stuff we couldn't see. I, I think that's a real thing. That's an actual signal from something. Now, who knows? It could be a background pulsar or maybe it's a higher energetic jet coming out from M82, but it's real. It's not noise. That's a real, you know, the, the NRAO who took this image uh, tried to get rid of everything that was fake and keep what's real. So, and it's all about signal to noise. Life is about signal to noise. And you'll see that comes up later again. Um, so BMX is the prototype for Puma, which is the packed ultra wideband mapping array uh, Puma is pretty cool. Puma is going to be gigantic if we get funding for it. So Brookhaven Lab is, is working on uh, this. It's going to go redshifts up to Z equals six. That is really, really far and really, really old in the universe. Because as you know, old and far go together. Uh, it's also a, a broad range, but sort of focuses on the 21 centimeter line. Um, we're going to start with a 5,000 uh, petite array. Uh, and then hopefully go up to 32,000 elements also in hopefully the Atacama region of Chile. So this is, uh, this is something Brookhaven Lab is pushing towards. This is why we built BMX. We're demonstrating things can be done in the 21 centimeter range and uh, discoveries should happen if we can keep going with this. So this is, was that? 
Yes, the cat is included for scale. That's that came with well, because Puma, it's a Puma. Ah. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> Chile. It's similar, it's similar to the Alma. In fact, maybe like next door to Alma. Because there's and so why did why by the way, why does everybody go to Chile with their telescopes? There's lots of reasons. Now I, I do when I do my Vera Rubin LSST talk, we talk about this, but it's mainly because the president of Chile is a woman and she keeps everything dark, radio and lights, because she likes having customers like us there. Um, so Chile is a good place to set up an observatory and they're trying to keep it that way because they're very intelligent with their light and radio noise pollution there. So that their workers, that people that live there get to work in places like this versus other types of industry that could show up there. So um, what's that? Well, okay, so there's more reasons. It's a desert. It's not under the jet stream, right? So there's, you know, it's, right. And, and they have altitudes. They have altitude, desert, no jet stream and no light or radio pollution. Uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about radio astronomy is Lucy. A lot of people don't know this. I'm working on this one too, by the way. So I worked on BMX. I didn't work on Puma. I am working on Lucy also as a thermal engineer. Uh, the Lunar Surface Electromagnetic Explorer at night. So it's Lucy night. Uh, Brookhaven Lab is building a radio telescope that's gonna go on the far side of the moon. Uh, and it's gonna be launched in 2025 on a commercial vehicle. It's coming up fast. We're not done, we're behind. Um, what is it for? Well, we're gonna try to look at signals from the dark ages. So we already talked about the cosmic microwave background. This is a small image. I think I go to a big one. Yes, I do, good, so I'll wait for that. But we're trying to get radio signals that you just can't get on earth. No matter how low noise you make it, no matter how big an array you build, these are just very, very weak signals from the dark ages. Um, and the dark ages are somewhere between cosmic microwave background and the formation of stars, and right before or at the, or at the verge of reionization. So this is you know early time of the universe, like maybe like a, up to a, maybe a million years of the universe, but not a billion. Um, so it's gonna be on the far side of the moon. It's gonna be 21 centimeter. This is the big thing now. Uh, emissions from Big Bang and beyond. It's 100 kilohertz to 50 megahertz, so kind of like AM to FM, once again. Uh, Brookhaven National Lab is designing the core science package. Uh, we're getting some help from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And it's gonna launch in 2025. And we have several locations that we're picking out. Location one, location two, location three. There's only gonna be one of these, but we're trying to pick the best spot to land and not crash and you know all this nervousness that goes when you've worked on a project for years and it's about to land on another celestial body. Uh, but it's really cool. And once again, the electric engineers make heat and I have to get rid of it. It's, that's my job. It's uh, not so easy on the moon to get rid of heat. When the sun is out on that side of the moon, it gets really, really hot. And then you got to point like a collector to the night sky, which on the moon is very cold and take that coolness and stick it through your electronics and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a cool project for me to work on as a thermal person. Um, so the dark ages, this is, so first we had ionization, right? And that's kind of what started all stuff, you know, going with photons shooting out, but the photons couldn't get anywhere. They were blocked because it just didn't have the transparency of the universe. It was, the photons didn't have enough energy to break through the other schmutz, if I'm allowed to use them. Is this far north? Can we say schmutz? I think we can from New York. Um, so, um, so there's this dark age period that we have no data from. We don't really know. And that's what Lucy is gonna to try to solve is, you know, what signals are coming from that period of the universe. And then we have reionization and that's how stars start generating and creating fusion and everything else. You have to ionize again to start getting into these energy levels that the universe exists now. So we have ionization, no ionization, and then reionization. That's how the, the big bang theory works. Um, so this is Lucy and I think that's the last slide. So that's what we're trying to study is that region there that we have very little data on mostly theories and equations, but not much data to back it up. And there's a nice you know, rendition, of course, not real, of, of Lucy on the far side of the moon when the sun is just rising, it looks like, or setting. Um, so what if I wanted to do, or you wanted to do radio astronomy, how do we do it? Um, so the itty bitty radio telescope, I bring this to NEEF almost every year uh, and I set it up and the only thing it really picks up is the sun, but it's pretty cool because if kids are walking by and you're like, oh, you wanna hear the sun and this thing will squeal, when you get it on the sun, it also squeal if you get it to like DishNet or Sirius or something else. Um, and it's really inexpensive. The satellite dish, of course, was free because I switched the cable. Um, and the finder is only $7.99, was $14.99. You save 47%. Um, and, and so why do they make 
um, satellite finders? Well, for people that go camping in RVs, but they're not really camping because they want to watch television. So they have to get this to figure out where to point the dish when they show up with their big RV, right? This is a big market for these, uh, which is probably why it's so cheap. Um, there you go. So anyway, we'll summarize. Uh, the radio astronomy summary. One, your eye is not a radio receiver. All great radio astronomy discoveries are made in New Jersey. Uh, a satellite is finder is only 7.99, you save 47%. And as I said, 21 centimeters or 1420 megahertz gets through more schmutz than visible light. It gets through the schmutz of the universe, not the schmutz of the atmosphere of the universe. <laughs> um, so now the second half of the talk, how am I doing on time? Pretty good. All right, uh, gravity waves. So what are gravity waves? Uh, now, a lot of amateur astronomers don't know much about this, but maybe this will become something you'll see at the end. So they are ripples in the fabric of space time, right? This is something Albert Einstein predicted in 1916 as part of general theory of relativity, that there would be ripples from large masses, you know, moving around in space or in moving around, I should say better in space time, because it's really one thing. Uh, it transports energy as gravitational radiation. And it's a form of radiant edge and energy similar to electromagnetic radiation, but there's not an ounce of electromagnetics in it. There are no electromagnetics in gravity waves, but oddly enough, it travels the speed of light. I mean, which is, that's just really weird to me now. It has nothing to do with light, nothing, but yet it does. <laughs> right? So this is, you know, and that's as much as I understand. Don't ask me questions on that, uh, right? But this is what Einstein predicted. If you have two very large bodies interacting, you're gonna generate gravity waves that travel the speed of light. Um, so I have to just quickly, now we're gonna talk about the instrument that's used to detect this. So I, I don't know if people are aware of this, but waves can join together and be constructive or they can be destructive. Has anyone here ever tuned the pianos the old way with tuning forks? So you know about constructive and destructive interference, right? You have to be one beat off on the two or three strings, depending on the lower or the high end. And that's how you know if your piano is tuned. You don't even have to have a good ear. You just have to hear that beat frequency from the interference. Um, so this is how the, these detectors work. They work off the constructive and destructive interference of waves using something called an interferometer. So a laser interferometer or any light interferometer, and the first interferometer was not a laser, it was in the 1800s, long before the laser was invented. Um, but basically you take light and you split it with a beam splitter, which is basically a mirror that's like half reflective and half clear. And if one of the waves changes a little bit, you'll get either destructive or interference from the waves that are coming from the same exact source of light. And that will tell you how far one of those two other mirrors are moving, right? This is how an interferometer works. It basically, you can move something a very tiny amount, like a fraction of a wavelength, and this will detect it. And wavelengths of light are very small. So you can detect very small motions very accurately by using this interferometer, which Mickelson Morley were credited for its invention. And this is the principle for LIGO, which is a giant interferometer. How giant is it? It's big. Uh, this is the one in Livingston, Louisiana that was built. Uh, I think they started this in the 70s. I'm not sure, a long time ago. Uh, that's in Livingston, Louisiana, the LIGO there. And then there's one in Hanford, Washington, the state of Washington. Uh, that's the other LIGO. So there's two LIGOs in this country. Um, and so quickly, like I said, I'm a mechanical engineer. So this is the part that I find amazing. Uh, basically, it's a simple concept. You're gonna hang, hang what they call a test mass, right? It's just a very heavy object that's reflective. So it's also a mirror. And you're gonna shine a laser through a beam splitter. Um, and then you're gonna let it come back and go to a photodiode and see if either of the masses move. And if you make this thing big enough and the test mass is stable enough, you should be able to detect if the space that these things are contained in move. We're actually looking for the movement of the space this is hanging in, right? The actual space time we wanna see, did, did it change? Which is a weird, like I said, this, if this is hard to understand, that's good. That means you're thinking about it the right way. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to understand. We wanna see if space itself moved on earth at some distance to see if we're picking up ripples from gravity waves from something out in the universe. Uh, it's an engineering marvel. This is a quadruple pendulum. They started with one, they went to four. It's a mass hanging from a mass. And the reason they did all this is they don't want a truck going by or an earthquake to set this off. They want the only thing that's gonna make this move is the space time it's hanging in. It's sort of like as free as it could possibly be. 
and it really is an engineering marvel and, and the numbers say it all. Um, uh, so anyway, so they, so I think I skipped a slide, but anyway, okay. So as always, by the way, I think this happens always in science. They were doing an engineering run. They were commissioning it. And while they're commissioning it, they discover something. I think this happens all the time in science. Like you, you just finished building something and you, you know, you know, the first time you plug it in, you're like, oh my God, what is that? And it's already working. So September 14, 2015, they were doing an engineering run and they picked up what was unmistakably a chirp from two bodies orbiting each other, which they could very um, accurately <coughs> model using, you know, like Kepler's laws and gravity, nothing super complicated and say that, yeah, this is what would happen if two objects were orbiting and eventually collided. This was a, they believe a, a black hole, black hole merger. Uh, and, you know, it made all the news, right? It's, uh, it was all over the world, not just here. Um, and there's a little, little um, showing the signal coming in, uh, which is on the order of, of, of Hertz, you know, like, like sound waves. If you could convert it to a sound, you'd hear it. If you could convert the signal to a, a audible sound wave. And there's the chirp. And this is both on the left is um, um, Livingston, Louisiana. On the right is Hanford, Washington. And they both got it about the same time, but the slight difference in time helps them to figure out where it might have come from, which we're going to talk about. So what is so here's this. Now I got the numbers. I should have done that one first. Uh, LIGO measures strain, basically. It's measuring the change in length per total length. That's the definition of strain. Uh, it's one over one with you know, too many zeros. I can't even count them. It's one sextillionth. It's, you know, or if you want to look at all those zeros in a four times the diameter of a human hair, this is the amount of motion we're measuring. It is the most highest resolution instrument ever built on earth. There's nothing on earth that can measure something down to this accuracy than the LIGO detector. It's just, a, it's an engineering marvel. It really is. Um, and and I, I like talking to amateur astronomers, which I am about this because astronomy is one of the sciences where the instruments almost drive the science and not the other way around. Like normally scientists, they want to do something and then they start specking it out and then they build something to do it. But, you know, think about Galileo. It kind of happened the other way around because of Galileo using a telescope is how astronomy exploded into what it is today, right? It's kind of backward. The, the instrument created the science in some ways. So, and as an engineer, I'm allowed to say that. And if you're a scientist, you can argue with me. But I kind of think this is where engineering and science really start like working perfectly together, right? Because you need this kind of sensitivity to get the discoveries we want to make. And, you know, imagine if Albert Einstein could be alive to see this, right? Um, these are all the LIGO discoveries. It's, a, it's, a, it's small on purpose. I don't expect you to see that. There's been a lot. And these are ones that are confirmed. Um, and then if you, get, if, you, if you want to make it a night chart, they determine whether it's a black hole, black hole, or a black hole neutron star. Here's neutron star, neutron star mergers and things like that. And this is all based on modeling and everything else. And they try to filter out noise and it goes through a whole bunch of um, sort of, you know, uh, combing to make sure it's not a fake signal because otherwise you look silly. You publish a paper and like, no, that was, that was a truck driving by on the expressway, you know, or something. And, and by the way, the, the other thing I wanted to um, mention with the, uh, the discovery is uh, a lot of people don't know this down at LIGO, there was a certain group of people like top secret that would deliberately create a signal to see how everybody responded. And the people didn't know whether it was real or not. And they had to decide whether this was a good signal or not. So they were actually putting in fake signals to test all the workers, including scientists and engineers that work there to say, well, let's see how they do. And nobody knew. So, so this was part of that run. They're doing an engineering run. And they're like, wait a minute, that was a real one. You know, it's really weird how the whole, like I said, everything in science seems like by accident gives you the best results, but sort of by accident. Right. Oh, no, they just get, they just give them the signal as if it came from LIGO. They don't actually move anything. They just, oh, they do move it? Oh, that's right. They move it with lasers because photons have momentum. That's right. Photon pressure. Thank you. See, he knows. He's a physics fan. Right. Kind of like Stephen Hawking and that guy from Russia wanted to do to get something to get the Alpha Centauri in 10 years. They were going to blast something with lasers that was already in space, like sort of like helium balloons with cell phones and see if they can move it with lasers from Earth into, you know, speed of light speeds. That's right. Thank you. So anyway, so this is sort of these are all discoveries, by the way. All of these little dots you see are discoveries by LIGO. 
and what they think they are. So on the top is like your black hole mergers and on the bottom is your electromagnetic neutron stars and LIGO Virgo neutron stars are sort of weird, different mass ones. But, and by the way, notice these are small black holes. This is what LIGO's frequency is. It only goes up to 80 solar masses. Remember we were talking about the M87 black hole is 10 to the ninth solar masses. These are really small. These are like little black holes. <laughs> you know, they're more than eight solar masses, but um, so that's why they're black holes. And the ones less than eight solar masses are not black holes, they're neutron stars. Um, so here's some LIGO discovery shown by using sort of this triangulation method that the signal gets to different places at different times, this gravity wave. And then you can kind of use that to point to where in space did it come from? Like it came from somewhere, but where? And the bigger swatches are ones where you didn't have necessarily good you know, triangulation. But if you notice this one right here has a nice skinny little swath. It's still big in the sky. This is still many degrees, which is very hard, but they pointed visible telescopes right after receiving the signal, right? So, so, they, so they use LIGO, United States, our two systems. Uh, they use Virgo, which is in Italy. And I forgot what others, I think they just used the three. And triangulated back in the sky and said, okay, everybody look here, we might have something and boom, visible confirmation. Another human first, right? That we've confirmed visibly the source of a gravitational wave. So th to me, this is, you know, this is one of the biggest accomplishments of human beings, in my opinion, uh, <laughs> no, that we're able to take something that 1916 Einstein predicted now measure it and now get a visible confirmation of it, right? This is when you think of the building blocks that got us to this point, it's, it's amazing, right? And the number of people and everything. And I said, I used to play a little video of like the people celebrating at LIGO when this happened. But, um, yep, yep, this is actually in a galaxy. It's just in another galaxy, but, but, but they're, they're, they're fairly certain this is the result of a, a neutron, two neutron stars merging that also created visible light, like X-rays and gamma rays. And you know, I think they had um, the Chandra X-ray telescope picked up a signal. They had a lot, they had many sources saying, yeah, this is, you know, I consider X-ray visible, sorry, but it's really close. <laughs> yes. Yes. Why would that be? Good question. If everything's traveling the speed of light, but I think these are remnants of the merger, right? In other words, the merger happens and there was a time delay in, in the visual signal also. So similar to like before a supernova, we get um, neutrinos, right? You get the neutrinos before you see the supernova. So some things are ahead and some things are behind. So the neutrinos are ahead of supernovas. In this case, supernovae. In this case, the light signal is delayed from the gravitational wave. So the gravitational waves got here first, the light signal for whatever reasons, I guess like things happening in this merger came later. Um, and not a lot later, but you know, within a week, I think this was. Um, so this is the first confirmation of a gravitational wave event visibly. So now we start combining these things together and we can start making discoveries. Um, is, is there any delay caused by the, the, the fact that space is not completely empty and, and light doesn't quite travel at the speed of light? Boy, take a piece of glass. It travels slower through that, right? So that's yeah. a good point too. So thank you, whoever said that. That's other reasons, right? There's, there's smuts in space. It's uh, there's things light has to go through that maybe the gravitational waves aren't impeded by. So yeah, right, you just take a piece of glass or water and light slows down a whole lot. So yeah, that's a good suggestion too. So what's next? Well, there's this mass gap. We haven't discovered anything there yet. And we're not sure why, because the you know, solar models of you know, star formation says there should be stars between like two and a half and five solar masses, but yet we don't know if we've ever detected any. So this is a kind of an interesting, like if you're a PhD student in astronomy, this is a great field to go into, right? This is where we have to start looking and maybe LIGO will discover it, maybe something else will discover something, but there appears to be what they call a mass gap in stars. They haven't detected stars in this size range. And it makes you wonder why, because our models of how stars form don't predict this, which means either the models are wrong or there's something special about stars in this mass range. So that's one thing that could be next. Um, more detectors, of course, that's what scientists do. Once they find something that works, they make it bigger, they make more of them. They put 32,000 radio dishes in Chile. You know, this is what we do. Um, so 
operational, right? We have uh, Geo 600, Virgo, LIGO, Hanford, and LIGO Livingston. India is going to have one. Japan's going to have one. Uh, and maybe more, right? So we got Germany, Italy, United States, and maybe India and Japan will start helping us triangulate better where these signals are coming from. And by the way, with the one that was visibly detected, Virgo did not get a signal, which helped them triangulate it, <laughs> right? Actually not getting it helped them figure out where it wasn't, right? So, so that actually didn't, getting or not getting actually had equal weighting in terms of being able to find something. Right, because if they did get something, they'd use the timing delay. And if they don't get something, it says, "All right, that means it's not coming from here," because they knew which way you know Virgo would have detected it. So that was interesting. Um, so, what do I think is next? Well, like all things in astronomy, how about amateur gravity wave telescopes? I built an amateur radio telescope, right? So that's me in Cherry Springs with my Subaru and my tent and uh, my scope, because I go to Cherry Springs very often. And I don't know, maybe someday they'll start building gravity wave telescopes that you can pick up you know, maybe larger black hole mergers. Maybe we should, you know, look at ones that are in the uh, 10 billion or billion solar mass range. Um, so that's what I think is next. Probably, but remember, it depends how well it's built, right? It's a, you know, and if it doesn't, it, hopefully it's under warranty. It's a <laughs> so that's the end. And now I leave it for questions. Thank you. And from, from we can do from here or from, you know, the web world. I have yes. a couple of questions. Oh. Oh. Want to go back some slides? Snap, right. You know, the early, oh, thank you. Here we go. Uh, cosmic radiation. Yep. And so my question is, what is the temperature equivalent of the radiation we actually receive from the cosmic Ah, so as, as black body radiation goes, the 21 centimeter line is still pretty cold. It's in the cryogenic range, I believe, but I'm not sure. There's, there's things that get close to like body temperatures too that so, are radio. So the, the 21 centimeter line can tell you the temperature of the, what the source was? It'll tell you the black body or the Planck's radiation. It'll give you that. Uh, okay. But I'm not sure beyond that what information with temperature would you well, get. Well, for example, the three degree background radiation. Right, right. The cosmic microwave. So background. you can, you can, you know, using universal expansion, you can right. guess what the temperature of the emitter was mm -hmm. way back when. Right. That's true. So this is okay, this is a little what, higher than that, but not by a whole lot. What we see now is equivalent to three degree radiation. Mm -hmm. All right. So at the little blotches on your diagram. Mm -hmm. What what uh, equivalent temperature radiation would that be any idea i do not but you're right it, there's always a, a temperature um there's always a temperature associated with any wavelength of electromagnetic radiation right so infrared of course is you know getting close to human body temperatures and then you get into radio and now you're getting colder and colder and colder i think 21 centimeters is somewhere between this and infrared you know somewhere between three kelvin and say 200 Kelvin or something like that. So it's in that range, but I don't know the exact number. And it's broad because it's, you know, it's just the black body radiation. That doesn't mean that, like, for example, a good example is the sun, for example. I mean, the sun's at all temperatures and this is all radio and we're up to a million Kelvin, right? But now we're in the gigahertz. <laughs> so so it's, it's a broad range. Any body can give off many different temperatures and they can all come across as a radio signal. It just depends on you know, the sort of frequency and intensity that gives you the temperature. So it's not, it, it's not an easy conversion. Let's put okay. it that way. It's not a direct thing. It's sort of- That's why know, I didn't know what it was. Like you said, and, and I'm not an expert on this. So I'm just said, I just, it's just something I'm interested in. And yes. It's kind of a really weird question. There are no weird questions. There's only weird people who ask questions. No, I'm just kidding. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I tell that to my students all the time. Thank you very much. Um, you said that Jupiter, because of all the iron, it, it's like a magnetron. It gives off. Not necessarily iron. There's just some chemical coming out of Jupiter. Well, let's see. The, the, out of Io that works well with the magnetic field. So I guess it has some magnetic properties, but there's a lot of materials that have magnetic properties, right? Like, you know, nickel and maybe sulfur what or ionized sulfur. What does the earth look like 
with all the radio waves and TV waves that we're shooting out and now microwaves. Are Probably like stuff. dinner to some alien, I'm thinking, like a menu. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, you know, because uh, who was it that said we shouldn't be doing this? We shouldn't be sending out signals. So. Right, Hawking. Stephen Hawking was like, no, you're inviting everyone to come eat us. Uh, but no, the Earth is probably pretty loud, but I'm sure Jupiter is louder all by itself. I don't think the Earth, with everything combined, could ever be as loud as Jupiter. Jupiter is a really loud radio source. I think it's the loudest radio source in the solar system. Uh, louder than the sun, I think. And I think it's louder than Earth. Yeah, because Earth has a strong magnetic field, but nothing compared to Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetic field is really intense. What do radio waves look like? I'm sure I'm sure the earth is visible right I mean I just don't know from what distance and how sensitive an instrument you would need but you know we do send out a lot of stuff so um, in fact if you remember the movie contact that's part of that whole thing right with the 25 years and the swastika and I don't know it's a great movie if you haven't watched it watch it again or if you don't remember it the whole thing with the the Germans the swastika coming through as the signal it was really weird <laughs> Right, and they were demonstrating their radio prowess by putting out a super strong signal that probably is still traveling in space. <laughs> so, come and get us. So I think I thought somebody online had a question. Yeah, yeah. There um, we go. Scott. Oh, hi, Scott. Hi. Um, with, for, about LIGO. Um, at LIGO. Obviously, when you have gravitational waves moving through. The, the the weights that that oscillate the the same gravitational waves are traveling through the light that bounces back and forth so how do you wouldn't that kind of all kind of zero out well uh, I, I light mean, photons obviously it doesn't. Can travel the photons that's in a vacuum pipe it's independent of the so i know what you're saying there's like some kind of like space contraction for the light right that's, so it, yeah that's taken so. into account yeah, that is, I, that is accounted for in the length of the LIGO beams that yeah, the, the thing is, it's the difference of the two masses. The distances are the same right. for both masses. Right. But yeah, I guess somehow, the, uh, I don't you, know. You can, you can subtract that out. You, you could probably <laughs> do that on the, you know, th there are equations that will subtract that out because the distances for both masses are the same. It's the difference in the masses themselves. So the light should be affected the same. Yeah. The masses aren't. Right. Well, the light has to travel through that varying distance also. So that's why I'm, you know. I'm but but I think it depends which direction the wave is coming from. Right? Yeah. If it's, if it's yeah. parallel to one of the things, it might cause a problem. But if anything but parallel, it might not. Yeah, maybe right? that's why the, the Italian one didn't detect it, because it was lined up in the ring. Right, yeah, it was right. lined up in the wrong direction from yeah, where the yeah. signal was coming from. Yeah, maybe that's it. Um, yeah, it's and, a good and, question, though, right? If everything's affected, then how do you get any signal? But they yeah, somehow, right, right, mad through the magic of science and engineering, figured out how to subtract out the change in space for the photons themselves that are traveling from the mirror that moves. Right. And I have right. another question also about uh, interferometry and in, in the um, uh, light um, photons when they reach a an interferometer, you know, say a, a a visible light in the ferrometer, they the the each photon inter, interferes with itself, and you know the the wave enters all the apertures, and with a visible light one, the, the the delay lines have to make make it so that they all arrive at the detector at the same time, so that the light uh, that the um, the the wave gets to the det detector at the same time. So it goes through all the apertures and only becomes a particle when it interacts with the detector. So, so the, the wavefront only collapses when it's gone through all of that all at the same time. But with a radio interferometer, you have different dishes all over the world sometimes. And the and when a, a radio photon is absorbed at at any one dish the, the wavefront collapses so you don't get the interfer interference with all of the other dishes with that same photon so as far as i know photons arriving at different times even if they are close to the same time they don't interfere with each other they can only inter interfere with themselves so how does radio interferometry create uh, an image 
when it's all different photons? Do you have a? a it's, I don't it's know. A it's a good question. It's a, right. you know, we're not talking about entanglement, right? We're just talking no, about no, interference no, no. and destructive. Because yeah. you know, then there's the, you know, you get the HBT interferometer, which works off a different principle, right? That's the right, right. Uh, so you know, these are different photons arriving at very, very slightly different times, but somehow there's, there's some kind of interference. So, so the one I, thing I'll, I'll say that I think is happening is that the wave fronts um, can arrive at different times if the body you're looking at is not a point source. Like this is the first time they use like to get the diameter of Betelgeuse, for example, or Sirius, is that from different parts of the same body, you have photons coming in at the same time. Right. In other words, the left mm. side of Betelgeuse and the right side of Betelgeuse or east and west could arrive at the same time, but they came from different places. And that's how you get the diameter of Betelgeuse. Right. So it's not necessarily it's still the same photons interfering, but they're coming from different locations, not a point source. But that's yeah, just maybe, a what I have. Yeah, yeah maybe I'm maybe I, I'm just under the wrong impression that, you know, like since I know that photons interfere with themselves, create a diffraction pattern, maybe that's not necessarily needed, that you can have two different photons interfering with each other. I, I, it, I mean, that, it, that it, it is all about the wave. I know that. They yeah, very yeah. rarely get down to the particle level with this stuff, unless you right, get down right. to HBT type stuff where they're, yeah. you have muons being generated and everything else. But I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. that you can have this with um, large bodies at distances with the same light interfering. Yeah. Good question, though. You know, like the question is basically how does a radio interferometer work? And I don't know. Right. <laughs> I just <laughs> glad it does. Question I have is uh, regarding to where you had Lucy on the far side of the moon. Right. A rather wispy looking antenna ray versus the large size diameter dishes that we see. So I have a question about how that may work and, and how is it? aimable or is it just it, it's dependent upon the moon uh, just um, uh, in its orbit and the other oops, part right. about that no, is not I not assume, aimable and well the other side i'm just saying on the other side of that question is that uh, what else as far as communicating satellites they yes so there's an orbiting orbit satellite moon to to be able to get right. the so information. there would be an orbiting satellite that would pick up data once a day or once a moon day you know whatever and send it back from its um, transmitters, but it's only trying to pick up any signal at all. It's basically just trying to get a signal to prove proof of principle. So if we can pick up cinema signals in the 21 centimeter bandwidth and show that it's consistent um, with the source, the celestial source, then the proof of principle gets proved. And then we go to the moon and start putting up some Jansky arrays. So this is just a proof of principle device, right? It's very, it's two dipole antennas. You know? <laughs> That's what we got. It's a, uh, and the whole thing is really small and it's, you know, going up in space on a little small rocket. But yeah, it's a proof of principle and it's not pointable. We just want to get a signal. And then that proves that at least there's a signal there to be had. And then we can start dealing with, you know, tracking and pointing and bigger arrays and all that stuff. It's funny. So this, this, I was giving a talk at Suffolk County Community College where all ages were invited, like parents and children. And there was this like five or six year old kid that kept raising his hand. And his mother kept saying, no, no, stop, stop. I said, no, no, let him ask. What does he got to say? And he said, well, the moon has craters, right? So why are you sending stuff up? Can't you just get like a piece of aluminum foil and line the crater? I'm like, hire that kid. <laughs> like, you know, you've already got dishes there. You know, I was like, you know, you've got a, this is a from a five-year-old. It's like already way ahead of us. Wasted a whole lot of money. <laughs> anyway. Is the shadow on the dark side of the moon there just from the headlights of yeah, <laughs> something? It's it's fake. Everyone, knows. you can. It, it's, it's Stanley Kubrick made that whole picture. It's a, <laughs> that's a good slide. All right, all right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, thanks, Jack. And I'll give you, I'll give, I'll, you get the mic back. Uh, all right, beautiful. Thank you, Steve. That's marvelous. Oh, all right. Any further questions on Zoom? Hearing none, I guess that we will close the meeting for, uh, for March. And uh, once again, remind everybody that those who wish to join us at Pasquale's right down the street, welcome to do so. And um, 
we will see you all next month.